I don't like how low you had to adjust the mic. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for being here. Um, I think let's begin our program. Um, if we can all stand uh, for the national anthem by the Forte Choir. Everybody, Molweni, Njani. I'm not going to butcher Hossa any more than I already have. Uh, my name is Pearl Pele. I am a commissioner at the National Planning Commission, and I have the distinct pleasure of being our program director today. Um, so, if anyone would like to sneak in a shout out or a speech, let me know. I charge a fee, but I can get you on the program. I know someone. Um, we're here today for the 10th anniversary lecture of the National Planning Commission um, under the theme, how do we invoke and implement the National Development Plan to ensure a new socioeconomic heritage for South Africa? We come to this university knowing its incredible historical significance. Um, for those of you who were with us yesterday, we had a really cool, engaging event um, with students um, whom I should probably greet. So by way of greeting, hello Fort Hare. No, I see, I see you guys on social media. I know you have a little bit more in you. Hello Fort Hare. Thank you. Okay, much better. And by way of protocol, let me greet our ambassador who's joining us today to deliver our keynote. Uh, the Vice Chancellor and his team of leadership at the university, um, and of course the, the National Planning Commission, and most importantly all of the staff and service providers that have put this event together. 
So we're here today um, to talk about the National Development Plan and celebrate the, the 10th year of its existence. Um, like I said, we had a really great engagement yesterday, and I think if that was anything to go by, it is definitely no surprise that this university has created people who have shaped our country in such magnificent ways. And so from my side, I want to say thank you to everyone who showed up both yesterday and today. Um, and I'm hoping that this is not the end of our engagements with each other, um, but it's only the beginning. We are five years in the planning commission, and so hopefully we can get tired of each other over the next few years. Um, I'm going to move on through our program, um, and we'll begin with a welcome by um, our Vice Chancellor, Professor Sakila Bushungu. Um, Prof? Th thank you very much, uh, pro Program Director. Uh, good morning. Uh, we don't do it like that at Forte, we greet properly. Good morning. Yeah, this side is good. Good morning, that side. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. I'm going to do it slowly because there are people that I have to specifically uh, uh, acknowledge. Uh, I will start by acknowledging the Deputy Chairperson of the National Planning Commission, uh, Professor Tiniko Maluleke, who's up here, who, he will take the stage at, some, at a certain point. Uh, I'll greet members of the National Planning Commission, and I'll introduce them uh, at a certain point. Um, I would like to greet Ambassador Nozipom Kagatu Diseko. Thank you very much, our guest speaker for the day. Um, I would like to greet members of the university, the Deputy Chairperson of the Council of the University of Forte, Dr. Spogazi Koyana. Uh, Dr. Koyana, I'm going to ask that you wave. So, um, yeah, yes, thank you very much. That is the Deputy Chairperson of the Council of the University. Here, um, thank you very much. And of course, members of the Executive of the University, um, the ones that I can see here, Dr. Mayaba, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Vital, Renuka Vital. Uh, they wave, Dr. Mayaba. Yeah, that's it. Deputy Vice Chancellor, Dr. Deputy Vice Chancellor Renuka Vital, uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor um, uh, uh, Taulem Jimba, Tabasing Taulem Jimba. Thank you very much. Uh, the CFO of the university, Mr. Charles Matumba, and I think those are the ones that are present here today. Um, there are others, of course, and there are other members of the university. There are deans, uh, there are directors. Uh, they are members of the academic community of the university, lecturers, professors. They are members of the support services staff of the university. And then, of course, proceeding, they are also stakeholders of the university. I, I did not get the, the kind of the guest list, but I do know the one that I met, who's a regular, very active partner of the university. Um, that in fact, there are three of them. There are two councillors. Councillor Ngome, where are you? A local councillor in town. Uh, we work very closely with him. But just to say, Councillor Ngome, the water hasn't returned, so if you could attend to that. <laughs> and uh, Councillor Ngala is also in, in the confirmed his attendance. And Councillor Ngaye, who's the speaker of the Raymond Mtlaba local municipality. Councillor Ngaye, I saw you were with us earlier. Okay, he's, he's somewhere in the room. Uh, th thank you very much. Now let me just proceed and, and, and walk through the list of members of the National uh, Planning Commission who are present today. Remember, this is a partnership between the university and the commission. So I've already introduced the chairperson, Professor Maluleke, uh, or rather the deputy chairperson, who also happens to be the vice chancellor of the, university, of the Tswane University of Technology. I, I, I said to him, I emphasize that, uh, that uh, he's also here uh, as, as VC of TUT um, when he's here. But let me then proceed to acknowledge the others, and I'm going to ask, I don't know if, if I have the authority to ask commissioners to stand and wave, but let's, let's try and see this. Um, Deputy Chair, uh, rather, Commissioner Tsepo Fela, 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Boitumelo Ramatsetse. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner uh, Nigiwe Begicha. Thanks very much. So it is working. I can make commissioners stand. Um, Commissioner Pearl Pillay, who is also the program director. <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, Commissioner Pulane Mlokwane. Thanks very much, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Pumzile Chifunyese. Thanks very much. Uh, Commissioner Sue Bannister. Thanks very much. Thanks very much again. And of course, the secretary to the, to, to, for planning in the commission, uh, Dr. Rafilio Masiteng. Yes, th thank you very much, uh, Doc. So um, I think that's the list. There will be other people. I will stand up when I have to introduce other people. Uh, but for now, that's the list of people to acknowledge. And of course, there are others who sent apologies, uh, specifically the minister of, in the presidency uh, for planning, monitoring, and evaluation, uh, Minister Kungubele. Uh, um, she, he was going to attend. He is the chairperson of the National Plan Planning Con Commission. We, as, as, as the youth, we are speaking that language. We want to be part of the liberations. We want to shape the future of this country because we are the future leaders of this country. We, don't, we, we need to stop this thing of saying we are the leaders of tomorrow because if we still say we are the leaders of tomorrow, Prof, or Prof Sagela Bushungu, they will still be saying, I, they are the leaders of tomorrow, so we can still continue leading on. We need to say we are the leaders of now, because it is us, if we are not owning it, it will never happen. It will never happen. So what we are saying is, the National Democrat, the, the Development Plan, it needs to be shaped by young people. The, the National Development Plan, it needs the involvement of young people. The, this gatekeeping that is happening with, 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 to the youth, it needs to come to an end. We cannot gatekeep and gatekeep and gatekeep, and then we think that these old men in these dark corners, they will start to change things. They have been there through the struggle, and then we got to dem democracy, but still nothing has changed, because we only got democracy, but after that, nothing has happened. The development of this country is dependent on young people, the development of this country is dependent on the people in this room. The development of, 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 of our institutions of higher learning in particular is dependent on the people in these rooms. We need to be part of more deliberations. We need to be part of more decision-making bodies. We need to change these boardrooms that, that, that is occupied by these old men. We need to be part of these boardrooms engagements. We need to make more decisions because we have these decisions that we are making, it is impacting us as young people, and it is not impacting uh, uh, these old men that are, that, are, that are sitting in these boardrooms. Um, with, with those words, uh, I, 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 as the SRC president, as the leader of students, I fully, I fully support the program, and with, with, with those words that I have said, take it into, into consideration when you go back to your respective uh, 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 boardrooms. The youth is saying we want to be part of decision making. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, President. Um, our next message is a really important one. So yesterday we, so it's not on your program. I was paid a bribe to add this into the program. The nice thing about being the program director is you can actually do whatever you want and no one can tell you anything. And so we've added in um, a really important um, message. We had a youth engagement yesterday. Um, a lot of you familiar faces were there. Um, and we had really important conversations about what, when we say young people should be included, what does that actually mean, right? When we say that young people care about issues that are affecting um, us and other people in the country, um, what are those issues that we're talking about? Um, and so what we did was we asked one of the participants from yesterday um, to give us a quick overview of 
the key conversations that we had yesterday um, and hopefully give some insight to the planning commission and the university management um, into what young people are for to hear, um, are thinking, what their opinions are and what they, they consider to be important. When I spoke to her earlier, she said she was very nervous and I, I assured her that everyone would be very welcoming. So could we all give a very warm round of applause to Liso Ndiki, who's going to give us a quick message of support. You can do better, guys. She's so stressed out. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much to the program director. Uh, greetings to the most fundamental elements of nature, the humans. Ladies and gentlemen, preserve yourselves saluted. Ndiki Lisa is the name I respond to, and I am very honored to be part of the people that will be standing in this podium, and I am the youth of today. So I believe what I'm going to deliver today in this podium will be taken into consideration. Um, without wasting any time, I'll be giving a summary of what was happening yesterday, the solutions, suggestions, our views as the youth of the development, of the, as the youth on the development of South Africa. Uh, without going far, it starts from the youth being ignored, not receiving any acknowledgement of what we think. The youth is never involved. Uh, and in much of the borders, as the SRC president has stated before, that in much of the borders that make decisions about the development of this country, we are not involved. Um, moving on, we have politicians that tend to discuss and make decisions in the field that they are not qualified for. It has been overlooked and it is an abnormality that has tended to be made normal in this country. We tend to see ministers being reshuffled. We see ministers that are qualified for being in the health department, but are today the ministers of the department of police, the departments of deliver. They know nothing about education. All, what they know is the, is the department of health. We are at the time of load shedding. Uh, I'm very much sad and disappointed that our prof, Mr. Sekhela Busungu, was cut short during his welcoming because of load shedding. It goes back to what I have said, that we have people discussing about engineering, but they have studied and are qualified for their finances. Uh, there is a quote that says, a nation is alive only when it grows, constantly discarding its outdated traditions, habits, rituals, and assumptions. We must eradicate ignorance and illiteracy from our nations and in content to the nearest minimum for us to have a national development. Uh, with that said, maybe you're asking yourself, what is to be discarded? I'm not saying we are discarding our, our leaders. But I want, I want us to know that with them being there in those parliament and bodies, with the mindsets of the era that we have left, it is very much unfortunate that we will not see and we will not have implementation of what needs to be done today. It is a different time and minds need to be different too. Um, in these bodies that make decisions, we have politicians that neglect the professionals who are trained and well-educated for the departments. Um, moving on, there, there are rallies that take place in our communities. We, live, we come from the rural environments and areas which we are only informed or we are only engaged with when it comes to conferences, when we are begged for our votes. But when it comes to implementation, nothing is there. We are called on manifestations to be given lousy t-shirts that only... <laughs> We are called to be given lousy t-shirts that 
that cost only maybe plus minus 45 rands and food hampers that do not last even two weeks. But we vote for them and expect them to deliver services that are major. We expect them to build roads and balance budgets. We expect them to provide basic needs, which are houses and electricity and water supplies. What are they going to deliver when they only bring a lousy T-shirt? Uh, it does not only depend to the leading municipality or government, it, only, it also starts from education. The education system is also failing the youth, uh, the curriculum is not changing, the quality is not improving. We are taught things that are no longer relevant in our time, more of theory on white paper than training of what will be expected to implement. Uh, we all know that we have policies in our country, uh, and I also believe even here in our institution, we have policies that we, we must follow. Uh, when coming to the policies, yes, they have been written down, they have been adopted and they say what must be done and, wh and when must it be done. They are not really the matter or the problem, but the implementation is not there. Uh, I will reflect back to one of the incidents that was very much heartbreaking. I'd like to apologize to anyone that was affected. Uh, I, I, I'm not here maybe to, to, to bring up the pain, but I have to say this. There was an incident of teenagers being part uh, or being in a tavern, in your Benny Tavern in East London. Uh, may their souls rest in peace. Uh, it was said after the incident that the government is planning to increase the, the, to increase the age of the people who must be part or who must be in the clubs and taverns or consume alcohol. It was said it will be increased to 21 years. But the question is, were the children in the tavern be above 18 years? And the answer is no, which means it is not the policy that is the problem, but the implementation. Even if they increase the age restriction, we will attend, we will be there as the youth to consume the revolutionary drinks. So it goes back again to that uh, we are failed as the youth on implementation. We are not taken serious. We are not bring, brought up front to be part of the discussions because what we discussed yesterday, or let me say the solutions that were brought about yesterday were very much of great, of great discussions that I best believe if they were impl implemented by 2030, we would be far in this country. Um, as the youth, as, as I am about to leave the podium, as the youth of today, we have now seen what our leaders are capable of. It is time to stand up, work together, and implement the change we want to see. The youth of 76 did it before. They fought for what they wanted. Why can't we? Um, it is up to us to stand up. It is up to us to fight for the seats, not because of power, but because of we are the ones that are living today. We are the majority. Let us fight not to be put aside or stood back. We must fight to be part of the discussions and to be part of the people that dictate what to be done and how it will be better. It will benefit us better in the near future. Uh, before I leave the podium, I'd like to thank everyone that has been part of, of this NDP 2030. I very much appreciate that we have now been invited to be part of the NDP 2030 National Development Plan, if I am saying it correctly. Uh, I, I'd like to ask that it may not be the last event or it may be not, not be the last engagement we have 
with you as the youth of today. There is a lot that we can advise on. There is a lot that we can bring on the table to make our country better. South Africa is not a developed country. It has not been for years, for decades, but we are striving to have a developed country too. It is sad to see other countries developing and it is sad to see that we are trying in our best to develop our country, but we are failing because we are put aside. I don't know even if maybe we are undermined as the youth, but I beg to the NDP 2030 group that keep on engaging with us. There is more to come. Our minds are open. We want, we want to be part of the development. Thank you very much. Let's give Lisa another round of applause. I think she's earned it. Imagine, and she was nervous. I really don't know what for. I think, she, I think the young people in, in, at Forte were represented well. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, we're going to have a quick break in which this amazing choir who has been very vocal throughout the morning um, is going to render a musical item um, and then we'll, we'll move on with our program. Choir? Okay. <laughs> Dr. Kifilwe Masiteng, Acting Secretary of uh, the Planning Commission, as well as all your hardworking colleagues who support you in the office. Students of Fort Hare, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Chairperson of the National Planning Commission, Honorable Minister Gungubele, I welcome you to this prestigious and special lecture, which is dedicated to the commemoration of the 10th anniversary of the National Development Plan. On the eve of our National Heritage Day, it is necessary to state that, apart from the constitution of our republic, the National Development Plan is arguably one of the most important heritages that have come out of our democratic era. Such an expanded understanding of what heritage is would, of course, require that we go beyond the vulgarized and the vogue notions in terms of which heritage tends to be confined to the ephemeral and the superficial. Whereas the Constitution establish, as establishes the legal foundations on which our 20-year-old democracy rests, the National Development Plan dares to suggest the road and the route to the South Africa of our dreams. The country which Steve Biko described in the 1970s as, and I quote, a country with a more human face. That country in which there will be, and I quote Nelson Mandela in his inauguration speech of May 1994, he spoke of a country in which there will be work, bread, water, and salt for all. What the NDP puts before us is the tenacious suggestion that says that country after which we have aspired, that country for which we have struggled for so long, that country is a country we deserve, a country we dare not give up on, no matter what the past and the present circumstances might be. 
And so from the days of the National Planning Commission Green Paper of 2010, the diagnostic report, as well as the subsequent draft national development plan of the very first planning commission, there was always a delicate balance and a finely tuned dialectic between long-term aspirations and the immediate actions needed for those aspirations to be realized. The same dialectic shines through both the handover reports of the two past commissions. Sometimes we speak of these in terms of the disconnect between plans and implementation. There is a line in Bob Marley's song which is titled Survival, and it goes like this. Some people got everything, some people got nothing, some people got hopes and dreams, some people got ways and means. In a way, the work of the National Planning Commission, now enshrined in the National Development Plan, is on the one hand to instigate society towards the elimination of the distance between the wealthy, which Bob Marley characterizes as those who got everything. I'm not sure about that. And the poor, whom he describes as those who got nothing. Our task as the National Planning Commission is to help put an end to a situation in which some live only on hopes and dreams while others have ways and means. Indeed, if there is a golden thread that cuts across most, if not all, of the deliberations and the documents that gave birth to and were brought about by the National Planning Commission since its inception in 2010, it is this dialectic between hopes and dreams for a better country on the one hand and the necessary ways and means for the realization of such a country on the other. The aspirational side of this dialectic ensures that as a young democracy, we do not set the bar too low and we do not settle too quickly and too prematurely for a country that is less than we deserve. The aspirational side of the National Development Plan and therefore the work of the National Planning Commission is about the positing and the provision of a vision that helps us see further than the furthest that our physical eyes can see. Nigerian poet Ben Okri describes vision in the following manner, and I quote him, vision more than anything is what makes leadership. Many nations would be great if they had vision. Many struggles would truly shift the axis of our times if they had vision. There is no shortage of opinion, will, anger, or determination. The greatest lack in our world is vision, he goes on to say. We do not have those who can see far enough. We do not have those who can see beyond their temperament, their personal grievances, and even the limitation of their causes or their politics. It is not enough that we want to change the world. We must have a vision, a worthwhile destination for our fine rage. It ought somehow to begin with us, but it ought to end in the wide sea of all of us." End of quote. As both custodians, joint authors and bearers of the vision contained in the NDP, it is our task as the National Planning Commission to keep putting that vision of a healthier, more prosperous country in the faces of South Africans. In a way, what I've been saying is the reason and the rationale we are here today at this great institution 
the University of Fort Hare. The new National Planning Commission, of which I am Deputy Chair, has seen it fit to call upon the nation to pause and to reflect on the 10 years since the NDP was adopted as the long-term national plan of our country. This then is the moment to track and trace how we are doing with both the nitty gritty and the broader vision we set for ourselves as a country. So when we talk about cost correction, it is not merely the return to the set economic targets and social indicators, but also a correction of course in terms of how far we are drifting away from the country of our dreams in both tangible and intangible ways. We, as the NPC, are convinced that a return to the NDP vision and plan is one of the things we as citizens together with our government must do at this time. When we speak of the National Development Plan Review, it is not merely that we review a document and how faithful we have been to its precepts. No, we also wish to review what we as a nation have become in relation to the vision we had set for ourselves in the first place. In this regard, the cost correction we propose is as important and as pivotal as the recent gender review of the NDP. That review concluded, among other things, and I quote that, there is compelling evidence that shows how women's labor in the care economy is being exploited as unpriced public good. It is that caliber of conversation that we hope to ignite through this 10-year anniversary of the National Development Plan. We have come together here at the Mecca of African intellectualism, Kwano College. We have convened ourselves at this university of Z.K. Matthews, this university of Robert Sobu Ugwe, this university of Nelson Mandela, this university of Gertrude Ntlabaati. We have come to drink from the fountain in which several heads of state once drank. And so we have come here to review not merely the GDP and the unemployment rates, but also the levels of hopelessness and the growing sense of nihilism and tragedy as the country drifts further and further away from its founding vision. Our keynote speaker, Ambassador Nozipo Joyce Mkagato Diseko, is a veteran civil servant who has served at the highest levels of government. It's not my job to introduce her. But I don't think we could have asked for a better speaker than her. And so I, together with fellow commissioners, chose her very carefully. And we look forward to being provoked, to being inspired, to being made to think again by her input today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Maluleke. I think for all of us here today, part of what a, a vision for 2030 looks like is a South Africa in which we can all be well, right? And whatever that means for all of us, we should be able to work together so that we can all achieve that in, in all of the different ways. Um, I'm really glad that we had the inputs we've had today because I think what it tells us is that we really are all in this together, right? We there is no line between who we consider experts, who we consider community members, students, young people, employed, unemployed. If we all live under this South Africa, I think we all have a duty to work together to, to make it so that we're all well. Um, and so I hope that that's the spirit in which we take the rest of the conversation today. Before I introduce our keynote speaker, 
uh, she has advised me um, earlier this morning that she would like to have a very engaging session with everyone. She said, I'm not here to just talk and go home. And so we will we'll have a Q&A session after the ambassador speaks. Um, and so I would like throughout her address for us to think about some key questions, um, but also some key comments, right? I think our role here today is not just to ask questions, but to also participate, um, especially the young people in the room. I'm a little bit biased, um, but I think nobody knows what it's like to be young in South Africa more than the people who are currently young in South Africa. Um, and I think it's an important platform for us to air out some of our expertise in the room and, and hopefully we can all learn from each other. So to introduce our speaker, um, Ambassador Nozipo Joyce Mkakato Tiseko, she is an accomplished diplomat who has represented our country in various international bodies. She holds a diploma in social studies, a BA honors and a master's of arts in politics, philosophy and economics from Oxford University in the United Kingdom. She also has a Master of Arts degree from Warwick University, also in the United Kingdom. Her career and her expertise encompasses, amongst others, the diverse fields of governance, diplomacy, international relations, climate change, nuclear energy, and higher education. We could not have found a more appropriate or more qualified or more dynamic speaker than Her Excellency. Um, like our deputy chair said, when we were thinking about who we would like to deliver this lecture, one of the main conversations we had is that we would like to show that the women of South Africa are actually the ones who make things happen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's important for us to reflect that in the work that we do. And so please join me in welcoming South Africa's Ambassador at Large for Peace and Security, Human Rights and Development, Her Excellency, Ambassador Mkrato Deseko. Thank you, Program Director. Professor Sakelo Bushungu, Vice Chancellor of the University of Forte, Professor Tiniko Maruleke, Deputy Chairperson of the National Planning Air Commission. Dr. Koyani, Chair of the Council of the University of Forte, the staff at Forte, students, workers of the university, or, and workers of the University of Air Forte, Mr. Snowy Hawker, the voice of the students. And Ms. Lois Sondiki, the rapporteur of the youth, members of the National Planning Commission present here, the list. I'm impressed that nearly all of the commission is present here, and the secretariat of the National Planning Air Commission. And dear friends and compatriots, I noticed also that the UNDP is represented here today. So dear friends and compatriots, I stand before you today in awe of the history of the University of Forte, in particular the role it played in the struggle not just of our liberation, but that of the region and the continent as well, producing wave after wave of formidable freedom fighters who embodied the same spirit and vision which is contained in the National Development Plan in wanting nothing but the best for their people, for us, and the future generations. I can imagine our late icons, uh, the first president of the Democratic Republic, Nelson Mandela, uh, Oliver Tambo, uh, 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 and other leaders harnessing their oratory and leadership prowess in the halls of this great institution. It is therefore fitting for the 10th anniversary of an, our NDP to be celebrated here at Forte under the theme, how do we invoke and implement the National Development Plan 
Vision 2030 to ensure socioeconomic heritage. I thank the organizers for inviting me to be a part of this celebration and to pay tribute also to those from this university, the province and other parts of the country who paid the ultimate price for us to be free. Our freedom did not fall from the sky. Sacrifices were made for it. Blood was shed for it and lives were lost in the quest for it. So program director for me and simply put, the NBDP is about freedom in all its aspects in democratic South Africa. It draws on the Freedom Charter and other key documents, such as the Reconstruction and Development Plan, to give us a vision of what it should be like to be completely free. What will we be, what we will be like as South Africans when we get to that point by 2030, how we get there and how we will know that we are there. It suggests key steps we must take to get to, to, that, to, get to that vision, goals, and targets. It seeks to make the lived reality of South Africans closer to that envisaged in our constitution. I'll be Sachs speaking in Geneva, explaining to human rights lawyers and activists that the South African constitution does not assume a perfect society, but that on the contrary, it is premised on the fact that there is a lot wrong with our society, which it seeks to correct through the Bill of Rights and the other provisions of the Constitution, all of which are, justify, are justiciable. It seeks to discipline the evil society which apartheid had made of our country into a much better society that is humane and caring. And in a similar way, the NDP takes as a starting point, what is wrong with our society and aims at correcting that. Program director, not only was the NDP widely consulted on when it was drawn up, it was also endorsed by all the political parties in parliament in a joint sitting. I also know that it informed the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its goals, the ND, SDGs, because when we negotiated the SDGs, we made sure that they took into account of the requirements of the NBG, NDP, not the other way around. Similarly, when we negotiated Agenda 2063 of the African Union, we made sure that Agenda 2063 was aligned to the NDP and not the other way around. Equally, when the Paris Agreement and the, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was negotiated, we made sure that it took into account the vision embodied in the NDP and the requirement for all the goals to be fulfilled. That is for South Africa as a developing country. It is important that we understand that South Africa is a developing country and not a Western country. We do not happen by some fluke of accident to be pegged at the bottom of the continent. We are African, struggling with the same issues that African countries are struggling uh, uh, with. So therefore, the policy interventions required for South African problems are different from those that are required for European countries and the United States of America. Program director for me as a civil servant and the teams that I've worked with, the NDP is our lodestar, which underpins our national interest. It is a beacon we must follow to ensure that we contribute to the realization of the rich tapestry of the vision of a truly free, free South Africa that is so profoundly outlined in the NDP vision statement where when we reach that goal, we can all say, and I quote, we, the people of South Africa, have journeyed far since the long lines of our first democratic election on the 27th of April, 1994, when we, elect, we elected a government for us all. We began to tell a new story. We have lived and renewed that story along the way. Now, in 2030, we live in a country that we have remade. 
We have created a home where everybody feels free, yet bonded to others, where everyone embraces their full potential. We are proud to be a community that cares. We have received the mixed legacy of inequalities in opportunity and where we've lived, but we have agreed to change. The way in which the NDP is put together, I dwell on this because we need to remember the rich legacy that we have in it. The way in which it's put together, taking into account our, of our history, also constitutes a powerful basis for binding us as South Africans together, not just in a collective sense of common purpose, but a common patriotism and a common loyalty to the continent to which our destiny and fates are inextricably woven. Again, also movingly described in the vision statement of the NDP that when we get there, we say to one another, I cannot be without you. Without you, the South African community is incomplete. It's an incomplete community. Without one single person, without one single group, without the region or the continent, we are not the best we can be. Program director, with the NDP so comprehensive in its vision and the targets it sets, the theme chosen for this celebration of how we can invoke it, and I would add with a sense of urgency to transform our society is apt. And I'm certain you will agree with me that although there's been some progress towards the 2030 targets, a lot more still needs to be done with regards to its central objective of eradicating poverty, achieving equality, and addressing unemployment. Nothing drives home the urgency of the need to ramp up progress on these three objectives, like the unrest we witnessed last year in a context where service delivery pro protests, which are indicative of frustration by communities, have become endemic. The levels of crime have heightened insecurity. Gender-based violence continues to blight the soul of the nation. And the economy, which has been struggling to grow, is further hobbled by load shedding, whose impact is not only acute among the poor, but also undermines service delivery across the board, from health to education, safety, and the effort to end gender-based violence, create jobs, and ensure robust economic growth. In these circumstances, and in the time left to 2030, which is eight years, how then do we invoke the NDP to catalyze significant progress, to safeguard our democracy and institutions? Because what is at stake should we fail? Maybe our democracy and the stability and the security of it, as we saw last year. I think, for me, the answer to this requires that we walk back a bit to assess the progress made thus far on the NDP targets, the challenges encountered, and what must be done to address these. And in reflecting on this, let us be guided by the words of the Pan-African Revolutionary Amilcar Cabral, when he said, I quote, hide nothing from the masses of our people, tell no lies, expose lies wherever they are told, mask no difficulties, mistakes, failures, claim no easy victories. In this regard, most analysts would agree with the NDP, with the, with the 2020 NDP, NPC review findings that in the 10 years since the NDP was adopted, progress towards achieving the main goals and targets has not been what was expected. Program director, although South Africa has an extensive social, social grant system, poverty and, un and unemployment remain high, and inequalities have deepened along racial lines. The face of poverty in South Africa remains predominantly black and mainly African young and female. In 2016, there were approximately 16.8 million people in South Africa living in, living in extreme poverty. And at the beginning of 2022, 
approximately 18 million people in South Africa were already living in extreme poverty. This number is projected to increase to approximately 18.5 million people by 2025. The impact of the Group Areas Act and the Iceland line drawn right through the entire Cape province by the apartheid regime in order to systematically underdevelop the Eastern Cape stubbornly persists. This province, this province, which gave us fearless leaders like Nelson Mandela, Oliver Tambo, Steve Biko, Mapetla Muhapi, Victoria Mklenge, Mklenge, Tenji Wemtinso, and many others, is marginally the second poorest in South Africa, next to Limpopo, according to the latest statistics by State South Africa. Sometimes it is the poorest. It's rated as the poorest province in South Africa. The NDP, NDP target for unemployment was that it should fall from 27% in 2011 to 14% by 2020, and finally 6% by 2030. The target set for employment creation was that it should rise from 13 million to 24 million. Regrettably today, South Africa ranks highest in the world in unemployment. In 2020, World Bank data put unemployment in South Africa as at 29.2%. As at the end of the second quarter of 2022, it stood at 33.9%. The young, the youth, continues to bear the burden of unemployment with an un unemployment rate much higher than, that national, than the national average at 53%. Again, the face of unemployment in South Africa is largely black, is largely black and mainly African, young and female. This is a point that the NPC review notes repeatedly that the privileges attached to race and class persist and continue to determine the quality of life for people. So when we talk about unemployment in South Africa, it's important to remember where it is, where the people who are unemployed are. They are in places like Soweto, Mitchell's Plain, El Dorado, Kaili Chakwamashu, Mtansane, and Selamans, and not in Senton. Brooklyn, Camps Bay, Umtlanga, or Hillcrest. As at June this year, the Eastern Cape officially had the highest unemployment rate in South Africa at 52%, 52.6%. This means that over half of the people who could be working are unemployed. Program Director on Tackling Inequality, the 2030 target set is a reduction of the proportion of people living below the living bound poverty line from 39% of the population to zero, and the Gini coefficient from 0 0.69 to 0.60. However, the present situation again, according to the World Bank report, World Bank report released on March uh, the 9th, 2022, is that South Africa is the most unequal society in the world, ranking first amongst the 164 countries that were assessed. The World Bank further attributes this to the legacy of colonialism and apartheid, which continues to play a role in reinforcing inequality with race and gender, still key in African rural women the most affected. Women earn roughly plus minus 38% less than their male counterparts. These challenges are magnified by population growth and migration. Furthermore, insecurity among our people has been heightened by dramatic, dramatic increases in crime and gender-based violence. Challenges to social co cohesion uh, 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 persist. Fierce competition for meager resources among the poor uh, and uh, it continues with conflict in com communities uh, between South Africans and their fellow Africans. It is telling that this conflict is mainly in townships and not in affluent 
suburbs. The effect of all of this has been an erosion of trust by our people in our constitutional institutions and our leaders, as found by the 2021 Afrobarometer. The survey found that only 38% South Africans trust the president, 27% trust parliament, 24% trust local councillors. In addition, only 43% trust our judiciary, and 36% trust our independent electoral uh, commission. Trust in political parties also continues to decline, with the ruling party at 27% and opposition parties at 24%. Uh, Most worrying was the finding that two-thirds of those polled, who roughly indicate 67%, of the population indicated that they would be willing, they would be willing to give up elections if a non-elected government could provide security, housing, and jobs. They would be willing to give up our democracy and allow a demagogue, a demagogue to take over or a populist formation if it could provide security, housing, and a job. This trust deficit is significantly higher among the youth. I cannot fully stress the danger this poses to our democracy, as I said, in providing fertile ground for demagogues who may roll back what was accomplished through pain, sacrifice, and blood shed. I thought I must also say something about climate change. On climate change program director, I think key to understanding this global challenge and how to respond to it is that it's not new. It began with the Industrial Revolution. Charles Dickens, in his novels, chronicles the or or origins of it and its trajectory. Africa and other developing countries like the small island states have been feeling its impacts for decades, which are also now being felt by developed countries. To bring down greenhouse gas emissions will take all countries acting together simultaneously at the same time to reduce their emissions so that the sum total of their emission reductions lowers global warming significantly. Nothing South Africa does alone here will bring down climate change. It may contribute in the long term. We, we must all blink together. That is why the multilateral rule of law in this is important, to ensure that developed countries as the historical major emitters who caused this problem in the first place lead. They are supposed to take drastic action to cut their emissions with developing countries doing what they can while they address poverty, while they address unemployment, while they address income inequalities. The challenge is Measures required to address climate change have a direct impact on your ability to sustain growth, competitiveness, address inequalities, and all of those challenges. It would seem that where we are at, developed countries feel that their priorities are more important. Recovery in the Western countries is much more important than addressing the legacy of apartheid in South Africa. And therefore do not want to do what they are supposed to do. I say this because the international multilateral rule of law allows South Africa space and scope for maneuver 
in juggling the challenges that it has while it strives to meet or contribute its, its share to climate change. This is a space that everybody must be involved in so that collectively we all know what we're willing to compromise and sacrifice and what the implications of a particular measure that is taken are going to be on school feeding schemes, on the creation of jobs, on the economy, on our competitiveness. We are covered by the international rule of law. It allows us space that it does not allow to developed countries. And to young people, I would say to you, listen carefully to what the West is saying, that we must all do more. What they mean is that they need everybody to do more so that they can do as little as possible for their economies. The United States of America, which is not the enforcer of climate change, we have a body responsible for climate change. It's the conference of state parties that decides and allows South Africa that scope. So I will approach the issue of climate change by saying debate here needs to be, to take place on the choices that are available to us against the priorities and the targets that are set in the NDP. That is why when I began, I said when we negotiated these instruments, we made sure that they took into account of the National Development Plan. The National Development Plan in being implemented doesn't have to be twisted to fit into the Paris Agreement or the UNFCCC. We took it that we would need some scope so that we deal with load shedding in a meaningful way. As we strive to do what we can as a developing country and an African country. I've noted that the media defines South Africa anomalously in relation to international law as a major em emitter. While our emissions in the continent may be relatively higher, according to the instruments, we are a developing country and an African country. Simply, no more. We're not like Europe. We're not like the United States of America. We're not like the UK. So, to continue, I think for us, it's important that we brace ourselves and focus on adaptation. Adaptation is important so that we can deal with the floods in Deben as it pertains to the creation and the building of resilience of the economy. That's where we need to be. As we, we strive to contribute what we can, it, the resilience of the economy is important. And adaptation to be able to respond to the impacts of climate change is very important for uh, South Africa. So just quickly, I know time is moving, program director. The overall picture I've painted on the progress, on progress, on the NDP doesn't seem to be uh, encouraging. And the question then is, where is the problem and what needs to be done? While I agree with many of the findings by the NPC and the recommendations that it, it makes, for me, the fundamental problem is not that the NPC, as the NPC says, that I quote, the NDP did not spell out an implementation plan with sufficient rigor and detail beyond the broad approach it outlined. No, that is not the duty of an aspirational plan like the NDP. It gives us enough to lift off. It is not the purpose of an inspirational plan Tran inspirational transformative blend like the NPT, NDP to do this. My argument will be that the problem lies in the fact that virtually South Africa does not have a public service in the proper sense of the word. 
What we have instead is a loose formation with pockets of excellence, which in general does not deliver services, but instead, with a few exceptions, like teachers, doctors, nurses, the police, and your diplomats in the foreign service, and a few others, which on the whole is in the business of outsourcing services to the private sector. A private sector that initially had no history of working to the common good. When we transformed in South Africa, our private sector had had no history of rising to the common good or working to the common good. Now, this creates a unique interface between the private sector and the public sector that is the genesis of corruption. I would encourage the NPC to focus on this and to visit countries. The interface between our public service and the private sector may turn out to be rare in the world. So when officials come into the office and a function needs to be fulfilled, theirs is to design a tender. But they're not trained to design tenders. The tragedy about this is that, whereas chapter 10 of our constitution defines good governance in the nine principles that we have, our good governance is given in chapter 10. The public service must categorically do A, B, C, D, E, F. The public service must consult the citizens, must. It's not an option. Once you've ceded the deliveries of services to the private sector, there's nothing to consult about. But how is, how is the community to interface with the private sector in the design of the programs? This is a fundamental flaw, the model of service delivery that we chose. I don't think was appropriate to carry the vision contained in the Freedom Charter, the Reconstruction and Development Plan, and the National Development Plan. The philosophical approach of that model ideologically says the state has no business being, invo being involved in the delivery of services. Give it the delivery of services to the private sector. The invisible hand of the private sector will sort everything out. So the quasi-privatization of the delivery from, of services set us up for where we are in a very big way. Nearly all the functions that have to be fulfilled in the Eastern Cape, at local government, if anything has to be done, you outsource it. So the key function really of our civil service is to outsource. Yet civil servants are not trained. You know, a nurse is a nurse, a doctor is a doctor. And they shouldn't be dealing with the manufacture of tenders. They should be caring to people. They should be caring to people. Skills are also of, in, further shallowed by the way in which we transform the public service. Every vacancy that falls open must be advertised in accordance with the principles of the market economy. So, we're not growing skills. What is happening is that the skills are being shallowed as public officials chase rank across the public service. A person can enter the civil service as an assistant director in January. By December, they're a deputy director. March the following year, they are a director. In three different departments, not in the same department three different departments. Before you know where you are, they're gone to the private sector on the basis of the CV that they've built in the private sector. So you have this game of musical chairs that is happening chasing rank. Because why? Every single vacancy that happens must be advertised 
akin to the principles of the market. The approach to training is equally problematic in the sense that, in the sense that this is reliant on outsourcing. So you've got variations in the public service of the interpretation of the instruments that are supposed to hang the public service together. We've got the public, the PMDS. You, you'll have a batch of departments implementing the PMDS a la Price, Waterhouse and Cooper, another one a la P KPMG, another one uh, a la Sam Consultancy, and nothing is such that it creates a common culture of running together and a common culture of understanding and grasping policy decisions similarly. What is worse than this is the hollowing out of the state by government itself in the creation of Section 21A companies and the parallelism of governance by committees and commissions and all of that. If a function can be created outside the state, the question is, why can't it not be created inside the state? And this way, I think the government would have a clear sense of how it actually says we will address youth unemployment because it would be in charge. It would be in charge. Uh, 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 so, I would urge the NPC to go beyond what it says that we need to have a head of a civil service, public service. No, no, I don't think so. I think it will help. That will help. But we need to go beyond that. Look at the model, revisit the model. When de Gaulle, Charles de Gaulle, the French diplomats told me this, was overwhelmed by the task he faced of reconstructing France after the Second World War. Apparently, a socialist academic said to him, sort out your public service and everything will fall into place. He did. Anna is exceptional or was exceptional in training officials similarly to be high performance officials. They've had their own problems, of course, after they fulfilled the mandate that they were uh, established to fulfill. Post Second World War Britain was rebuilt through a coherent public service that was efficient and was able to administer the welfare state. And that is why Thatcher understood that that civil service was never going to dismantle the welfare state. Public officials were not going to rise commonly together and dismantle the welfare state. And that is when the era of outsourcing began. And it was started by Thatcher to break the spirit of trade unionism in the UK. To close down mines. To sell off state assets that provided the social wage, such as British gas, British water, British health, that is why outsourcing, that is why governance by consultancies began in the outsourcing of functions. And here she was supported by theories by Milton Friedman and all of them arguing the state has no business doing anything for anyone in a democracy. Leave it to the market. The invisible hand of the market will sort out everything. An example I remember is when I was sent to Sweden is by Nelson Mandela to be chief representative, following the ouster of the Social Democrats after 45 years of governing continuously, they lost. And we weren't sure whether they were going to continue supporting the transition in South Africa, in South Africa or not. So I was sent to uh, Sweden 
uh, to work with a government led by the conservatives. They, as the social democrats were leaving, they came to South Africa. President Cyril Ramaphosa was with me. We were at a function where we were just, we didn't understand why they were relaxed, why they were very relaxed, having lost power. Very happy sharing things with us. We asked them why that was so. And they said to us, they weren't worried because the kind of public service that they had was such that if you gave it a problem, it would always give you a social democratic answer. And that was to be the case. After two years I'd been in, the, uh, in Sweden, I remember meeting the Prime Minister of Sweden and saying, no, are you not going to do what Thatcher is doing? And he said to me, my public service will ne would never allow me to do this. That is how I, uh, 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 my emphasis would be, so that we create a public service that's bound together by a common culture, a common patriotism, a, com a common uh, uh, allegiance to the state uh, with a culture of service delivery connected to, to the people. There's been a lot of talk about social compacting. My starting point is that the National Development Plan is the base social compact. But parties have forgotten that they endorsed it in a joint sitting. No party can say, no, sorry. It is the base social compact. The challenge is how then do we all lock into it and social compact in our different areas of activity. And for that, you need a public service, which from the beginning should have been ready with rigorous plans for the implementation of the National Development Plan. We knew the National Development Plan was being consulted on. We knew what ideas were coming. We ought to have anticipated what would be the end product of it and be ready with plans to uh, 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 um, implement it. So I agree, we need to have social compacting, but as long as you have the kind of state of affairs you have in the public service, there's no structure to shore it up. There's no structure to hold it and guide it. So I cannot stress enough the urgency of uh, the, 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 the need to um, uh, address uh, 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 the, the thing. You know, the Public Service Act vests functions that are unique in ministers and MECs and premiers, organizational functions and human resource functions. The public service belongs to the state, the state. It is the source of continuity. It holds us together in turbulent times, as the Kenyan civil service was, did when they had a, 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 a fallout, an election a, a fallout. I, I agree with the suggestion that head of the civil services uh, established, but I would urge that the recruitment and selection is centralized to, to mitigate the fact that our public service may be the only one in the, in the world that administers itself to the extent that it does. It's self-administering. 70% of the time is spent on self-administration, leaving 30% of the time to catch your breath and then deliver. They must design adverts for posts. They must, you know, job evaluate the posts. They must describe the posts. They must sit in panels to interview or to shortlist an interview. And after they've shortlisted, they must sit in this and that and that and make recommendations. By that time, a week has gone by, work has not been done because they self-administer. This used to be a function of the Public Service Commission, but it was taken away from the Public Service Commission. So when you then it's agreed to establish a, 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 a head of the civil service. 
uh, supported by a devolution of functions to the Public Service uh, 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 Commission, the head of the civil service can focus on performance. And then we revisit uh, the, 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 the model. The basis for revisiting the model has already been laid by the constitutional court in the Sasa ruling. When the constitutional court says to Sasa, you knew what functions were required for the delivery of grants. Not only did you know, you knew to a minutia what is it that needed to be done. Why couldn't you do it? This is a function you understood from beginning to end, but they were required to outsource it. And the corruption that has been spawned by that is, is just unbelievable. It is really, really unbelievable. Once we've sorted out our public service, or if we all agree, we need to take the NDP to the people, back to the people. It needs to be taken back to the people. Simplify it. When I read the NDP, nothing moves me more than the vision statement. It moves me absolutely. It gives me a sense of place as a South African as to who I am. It inspires me to action. I think it needs to be taken back to the people in simplified forms. A simplified version, maybe a booklet of the vision, coupled maybe by a little booklet of what then the citizens should expect from the state in the form of the simplified uh, goals, and then engage with the public We have the democratic state, we have the national development plan. In between, there are a lot of, there are a lot of problems. South Africa is not a failed state, in my argument. We have serious challenges, challenges but we have frameworks which if we implement the NDP, we will attain, we'll now in 2030, our story keeps growing as if spring is always with us. Once we uttered the dreams of a rainbow, now, now, city and across the land in an abundance. Oppressed by um, the apartheid government, and we were not oppressed. So their struggle is different from ours. They look at us as privileged because they don't understand our struggle. They don't understand how we go about on a day-to-day -day basis. So they look at us as less. So in governments with, the, with so much corruption in the ANC, EFF, everyone... <laughs> Everyone, everyone who acts like they are not corrupt, they're just less corrupt than everyone else. So how can we bridge that gap, that age gap, to make sure that there are more people, there are more youthful people in the government so that they can relate our struggles, so that they can relate our visions, more importantly. Because I feel like our visions are better than a 45-year-old's vision. Bars, thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to ask the ambassador to address the last three points. Um, so the one was the relationship between growth and democracy, the consequences for lack of implementation, and then how do we bridge the gap in leadership. Okay. And then I'll ask Prof to answer the one about students and the NDP. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Program Director. The questions speak to... I. Thank you very much for the questions that stress the, 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 
that there is frustration with the pace of service delivery and progress on the targets of the NDP. We're not getting there fast enough for uh, young people. Women, and I think I would say the, 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 the elder. I get that. And I think it's good that the members of the National Planning Commission are here to be able to use this as, a, as data. This, this, this assembly meeting we have here provides us with a, a sense of the, the, the level of uh, fr frustration that people have. Again, for me, the question that was raised about consequence management there's no service delivery, but there doesn't seem to be consequences. This could be within the public service, or it could be within the political system. Our political system guarantees consequence management in the periodic elections that we have and that we had at local government. There were consequences in October that seem to have been conveyed by the electorate. That's one area in which people express or effect consequence management. But within the domain of service delivery, you seem to be echoing what the Auditor General is saying about lack of consequences for corruption and service delivery. That is why I said, it seems to me that the key is in revisiting the public service how we transformed it in its shape and in its ideological perspective. In its ideological perspective, as well as its management to ensure that there is consequence management. South Africa is not a developmental state. We will become one when we have accomplished the things that are in the NDP. And if we meet the deadline of 2030, people will look at us and say, there is a developmental state. We aspire to be. Because a developmental state, I'm not going to, I don't want to open a debate here. The phrase developmental was coined by a gentleman who was trying to explain what had happened in Japan how they took off and lifted. The first book he writes is Japan. There's a subtitle called The Rise of the Developmental State. And that book is only about the relationship between the public service and the business sector, the public service and its people, bound together by a common sense of patriotism to lift Japan after the Allied forces left within 12 years. Key to these officials was never again would their country be put in the position that it was. In South Africa, we need to be saying never, ever, ever again are we going to find ourselves in a position we're in in 1994, the role of the public service. So you need to create, the value of this that I like is that it creates a platform for you to be able to set the terms for the time frame for these things to be able to happen. The, the NDP gives you language to hold government accountable, commonly, in Bishaw and in Cliptown. It gives you language that you can use in his imbizos when ministers come and say, but no, you have not done this that was said should be done, or this has not happened to us. But all of that, you're still going to have to come back and revisit your public service. We need to clean out the private sector in the delivery of services so that then we can talk to civil servants and say, we want this, that, that, that. There's no reason why for me, in the design of RDP houses, we don't sit with communities 
and get basic designs, talk about funding. But instead, a tender is issued, companies bid, abracadabra, shoddy structures come up. The RDP, I would urge you, in its totality, from the vision to the contents of it, gives you language. And I pray my plea again is, Prof, simplify it. Make it an instrument of community-based monitoring and evaluation. Make it an instrument of community-based accountability. So the gap between the youth you know, the, 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 the colleague that was asking, how do we address the gap between the youth and government? Who is government? It's us. We grew up in the townships. I grew up in Soweto. I know the state of Soweto. I know how water wastes when pipes are burst for days on end. My family lives there. It cannot be that as a civil servant, I am so divorced from the reality of our people that when I get back to the office, I ignore that. And I think a tender needs to be issued for a, a, a team building or strategic planning or for capacity building. It can't be. So you have in the NDP a document that gives you what I call common grammar. Minister comes to a mob. You say, no, minister, no, 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 no. Don't say we're going to do A, B, C, D. Say, we did A, B, C, D according to this target. That was set in the NDP. I do not understand why it is not clear that the thrust of economic policy must be primarily the townships, the rural areas. Why? Because Cape Town is developed, it'll survive. Senton is developed, it'll survive. I don't know why we don't take key institutions like the stock exchange to Kailich. Symbolically, that says we're doing business unusual. The private sector, if we were talking to the private sector, is civil servants. A different way of looking at catalyzing development because it's all said in the development plan. The areas that can catalyze have been neatly identified and furthermore they were identified in consultation with communities and inputs were uh, 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 made. I don't, I see the communication, communication being between generations being a problem. I usually say to my daughter, I was born in poverty. When we talk, I was born in poverty. I come from a working class family. I may look different. She's had opportunities that mirror reflect opportunities of a middle class person. But for me, the challenge is how do we make sure that we're all at the same level with a little girl that was identified as the subject of the NDP when it was designed to make sure that her quality of life is the same as ours and hers. So how do we communicate? How do we communicate? But also understanding, colleagues, I know you'll beat me on this, but I stand by this. When I was your age, I used to say to my mother, you did nothing. We, you, you know, you, you are cowards, you apartheid and what and what and what. We'll show you, we'll get rid of apartheid. And I came to learn with humility that there had been struggles that had unleashed levels of repression that were untold, but it's a different story from there, but what conversations are we having 
And I think this is the role that I think that moved me to come here because the NPC is playing, it may be that it also has to play that advocacy role. Using a CE in the NDP, an instrument of fostering or supporting social cohesion, gives us a common grammar. How do we say we're in this together? How do we say we're of one country? How do we say we have a common a, 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 a commitment as, 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 as it were? I think there's something to be said. Where I see the challenges, which is why I'm advocating a different, a, a revamp of the model of recruitment and selection, is that we need to have accumulated experience, grow accumulated experience for service delivery. Day. No, thanks, 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 Chair. Uh, my name is Nsenge Pumlan. Uh, Ambassador, you, you spoke very well. You spoke very well in the sense that what, what you speak provokes a lot of things. And the unfortunate part is that you will go back to your country where you are deployed as an ambassador. <laughs> and you are left with the current problem of leadership we have. In the present state of affairs, I'm trying to look in the NDP, probably not really as a plan, but as a vision. Because what is in the tale in this document does not provide a machinery of how do we arrive where we want to arrive in terms of practical actions and strategies. So hence it remains a vision to me. The country is in regress at a very high speed. We are no near achieving the NTP. Just now, as you were speaking, we are interrupted by load shedding, which is the energy crisis we have in this country. It's been over a week now. We've been on stage five or stage six in between the two. And there is nothing happening that this government is doing to prove a sense of agents on the load shedding we have. Yet, on this other side, we speak about recovery, economic growth. I'm trying to think that if this energy crisis we have, and we speak about luring in investors that will create job opportunities in our country. The country is in crisis of energy supply. Which are these investors who are intending to look in our country if we can't provide a sustainable and a reliable energy supply? The second part, the second part is that you put it correctly in your statement that government or public sector outsource most of its services. You speak that in line in your statement which you speak correctly about an agenda of South Africa being a development state. One of the major characteristics of a development state is a good and efficient public sector that is weakened by day. Our public sector is going down in leadership, in administration, and in all aspects of it. There is high level of corruption in the public sector. There is high level of moral decay in leadership. I'm, I'm highlighting this 
which are contra to a development state we want to achieve. So, Ambassador, until we are able to resolve a leadership crisis in South Africa, that's when we will be able to take a little bit step forward in taking our country to greater heights. Now, I just want to put... <laughs> yeah. as, as you conclude... As I conclude, thanks, Chair. Thanks for that. <laughs> the government is selling state-owned entities to the private sector. We want to attain development state but we are unable to run the state-owned entities. I'm just highlighting these issues, Ambassador Swart, as you, in your level with the president, you put that citizens on the ground, these are issues that they are not satisfied with. Thanks very much. Thank you. Th thanks, Program Director, for sorry, 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 sorry. for noting me without noticing I that. I did not. I did not note you. As I continue, uh, I will start by quoting. We're, we're, we're not going to do this. The SKA Mkai. Sorry, my 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 leader, my leader, my leader. Indo se suni zeni lumkele. Kuyo zalo kilika anko isilwe sna zuamnom. So, in the interest of fairness to the young lady who was noted, let's hear what she has to say. I'm happy to give you an opportunity but let's be fair to each other in the room. So let's go to the lady who was noted at the front and we'll come back to you in the next round. Is that okay? Thank you so much. Um, it's just a comment that I'd like to make, right? It's just a comment that I'd like to make about um, Bethita is very, um, she has a very positive approach to the NDP and everything, but us who are coming to university, we first year, second year, we go to these career expos, they tell us there are no job opportunities, but why are we still studying? Administration led by the president and the cabinet, judiciary led by now, uh, uh, Raymond Zondo. Legislature led now by uh, Minister Nosivuema Pisa Nakula. The judiciary is abusing, abusing administration and legislation. Minister Lindwesi Sulu said it one day in, his, in her article. I'm not there, I'm speaking about my views in this session. The very important uh, decade where we are finishing the formation or the establishment of the National Development Plan, NTP. In saying that, the confusion in these arms of a state Amid the grass to suffer, which is the citizens and the proletariats. Now, what is happening is that the administration as led by the president is actually giving a big ear to the private sector and selfish white monopoly capital. The white monopoly capital should be taxed if a business of a black man is taxed 14 or 15 percent VAT so that they stop 
trying to capture judiciary administration. When that day comes, the pains and the delay in implementing NTP, those things will end. And then the NTP and South Africa will go towards a developed state. Why Africa is suffering? Why the West and other countries are making South Africa to suffer? Why? Why? What did we do as people of South Africa? Why? Why people are coming from their countries here in Africa as this young democratic country that got democracy last in African continent? Why when they looted their resources in their countries and then in their now failed state, failing states, why are they coming to South Africa with wrong intentions and do nonsense in South Africa? Colleagues, I think this is an incredible response to our discussion on the National Development Plan. I think NPC, we have to come back again. I can't promise to come back with you. But you can get the sentiment. There are so many questions that arise that require more space. Um, to the young people that we were with yesterday, thank you very much. Liso and the team, I was very privileged to actually have um, coordinated the session that came up with what Liso presented here today. And I, as it, uh, as in, in terms of its many, many targets, is important to all of us also in the university and in the communities around us and, and for the Eastern Cape. Um, I especially want to acknowledge the National Planning Commission for the robust engagement sessions that they arranged and conducted with our students and, and for that feedback that, that we have received. Um, I, I really do feel that uh, the Commission has heard us and heard you and heard especially the students um, for the, f without whose voice we'll never make the right choices for the future. So I, I think that's been very important and I'm very happy to hear and to see the passion and the uh, insights uh, that you have brought to the discussion. I want to uh, uh, thank Institutional Advancement, the university's marketing and communications department, who work closely with the uh, national department in the delivery of this event, and also to thank the choir, as usual, for their beautiful performance. But I think, uh, most importantly, I want to thank our, uh, express our gratitude to Her Excellency, Ambassador Nozipo Matrakato Diseko, for the keynote address and for inspiring us for a very comprehensive presentation that was so thought-provoking and provoked the kinds of comments and discussions that it did. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for gracing us with your, with your presence here. And then also thank you to the uh, Deputy Chair of the Commission uh, for being here, for choosing to be here with us, uh, and for your contextualization um, of, of the NDP. I, I do think um, bringing it here and the engagement you've had has somehow reawakened and, and uh, made the NDP uh, something that we need to refocus and think about and make alive again. So I thank you very much for that. Um, yes, please do give everyone a round of applause. In, in finally, in appreci appreciation of uh, uh, the, the work that the ambassador has done, I'm calling on uh, two of our students from the finance department who are going to hand over a little gift. Uh, Lunga Mabongo.
Are you here? One of our students from the, or one of our artists from the Fine Arts Report <laughs> Ambassador, could, uh, could I ask you to come forward? And one more gift uh, to Professor Maluleka. Um, I'm Siposetu Ziwele, also from the Fine Arts Department, one of our students. And with that, thank you, everyone. Over to you. Uh, Program Director, a very big thank you to you for taking us through this uh, very, very fascinating program. Thank you very much. OK, that brings us to the end of today. Um, yeah, thanks, guys. <laughs> I'm going to hand over to Sandy Siwe. I, I saw her and then she vanished. To take us through what is going to happen in the next part of the day. Or, Mr. President, are you going to speak? I need to decide who to put the pressure on. There we go. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, as we, we are just solving the issue of the catering, uh, you can rest assured everybody in the building would be getting a plate of food today.